Hi, I'm James Bradley. I'm another of the original gangsters at ETC. And I have three Fred stories from the early time that I'd like to tell. Uh, the first is about innovation. There's a notion in business nowadays that's quite popular called best practices. And in some companies, best practices is used as an excuse to stop thinking. Uh, oh, we're doing best practices, as if that's the best thing you could possibly do. And Fred understood intuitively, as you got from Bill, that even at 18 years old, long before he'd heard that term, that best practices is actually a good place to start thinking about how this could be better. And Fred took Bill to see the best practices and light and control board design, and he didn't say to Bill, look at this, this is the best it could possibly be. He said, can't we make a better one? And so we set out to make a better one. And Fred understood that innovation was about trying things, and sometimes they worked and sometimes they didn't work, and if they didn't work, maybe you got to learn something and try again, but he had inventing in his blood, as you heard from Bill, and he didn't have anything for best practices, and that's one of the things I admire about him. My second story is kind of about courage, what I would call blind, stupid courage, because <laughs> in some ways he was much braver than I was. And about halfway through building the prototype for the light board that kicked off this company, we were sitting in the back of the physics department where three of us had jobs, and we weren't doing much physics department work anymore, but we still had keys, which meant um, at night we could come in and use the oscilloscopes and the uh, unlimited accounts on mainframe computers around the country and all the things the physics department had to offer. And in this way, really, ETC was yet another startup that was uh, really founded with the unwitting help of a major university. Um, <laughs> Was I supposed to say that? <laughs> so the, the thing, it's, it's, it was one of these projects where the first 90% of the project takes 90% of the time, and the last 10% of the project takes the other 90%. And we were maybe 90% done. So we thought, oh, yeah, not too much left. And, and then Fred, uh, Fred's friend, Gilbert Hemsley, who was on the theater staff, and I think you'll hear more about Gilbert in some of the videos, uh, I was on the theater faculty, arranged for the first national simulcast opera to, uh, to happen at the Union Theater in Madison. And for those of you under 40, a simulcast meant showing it on television and also showing, uh, playing it on FM radio at the same time because the television audio signals at the time were so terrible that it didn't sound good if you just had the TV. So it was a pretty good solution, but the first time this had ever happened with an opera and it was going to be broadcast nationally and live, was at the Union Theater. And Fred, being good friends with Gilbert, immediately got us signed up to have our prototype run the lights for this thing. Someone else like me might have had us sign up to run a local uh, stage play or something to you know, see how it went. Um, so, but that wasn't Fred. And we had six weeks now to actually do the last 10% of getting this thing working. And so we're kind of working around the clock a little bit frantically, and I'm pretty much terrified. And we did get it done, and we sort of, uh, feeling a little smug, we carried everything over to the Union Theater, and we walked in, except it was six o'clock on dress rehearsal night. And uh, as we walked in, all the sets were built, the lights were all hung, and people in huge costumes were running around the stage and singing fa la 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 fa la 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 uh, better than that, but warming up their voices. And it just hit me like a brick what we had really, what Fred had really gotten us into. Um, but Fred was excited. I was mainly terrified. Uh, but we had things to do. I, uh, we walked over to where the dimmers were in the theater, and I was carrying the box that connected our control board to the outputs that, give, that provided the outputs that went to the dimmers and actually gave control signals to the lights. And um, Fred connected the thing he had built, which fit our thing together with the, what was in the theater. And I walked over to a uh, little 
electrical outlet, and I plugged in my little three-prong electrical cord, and the entire theater blacked out. <laughs> and having built a few things in the past that had caught fire, I had the plug out of the outlet very quickly. <laughs> but I was expecting that the box in my hand would have melted or at least be on fire, and it wasn't at all, and there wasn't even any smoke, so all I could think was, it wasn't me. <laughs> It had to be a coincidence. Um, so someone went and reset the breaker, and I swallowed my gum and walked over to the outlet again, keeping firmly in mind, it wasn't me, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. And I plugged it in again, and sure enough, we blacked out the theater again. <laughs> this was an 800-amp breaker that had never been blown before in the history of the theater. <laughs> and it's now about 6.20 on re dress rehearsal night. Uh, and Fred never lost his cool. He was worried, of course, but he was completely confident that we'd sort this out. And I was, again, mainly scared to death. And somehow we did sort it out. We, we figured out that what was happening was it was powering up with all the stage lights on at full. And as most of you know, a tungsten filament, when it's cold, has a power surge compared to how much power it draws once it's warmed up. So for that moment, that cold surge on all the tungsten filaments in the house actually drew more than 800 amps, and so we actually blew the breaker. Um, so we did something so it didn't power up that way, and the show actually went fine. Uh, the dress rehearsal, the Friday night performance, the Saturday night performance, and Sunday afternoon was the simulcast with FM Radio National, and uh, I drew the short straw to babysit while everyone else went home to sleep for a couple days, and I sat in the balcony with no audience, it was just for television, and wondered what the heck I was going to do if all the lights went out on national live TV, which happily didn't happen. I've learned recently from Fred's son, James, that that service is still provided by ETC and that at this year's Super Bowl halftime show, <laughs> there were some ETC people there who were wondering what they were going to do if all the lights went out. They, <laughs> um, they may have had a little better plan than I had. My last Fred story is, I think, the one that touches me the most of the three, which, uh, and you could say it's about persever perseverance and determination. Uh, a few months later, after we had started producing this thing, and we were building it with someone else's name on it, and uh, we weren't allowed to say that we made it, uh, because these, this company in California didn't want the world to know that they were sourcing this complex piece of electronics from some teenagers in Wisconsin. <laughs> and we were trying to, our contract initially said we had to ship one a month, which doesn't sound like very many. Uh, but at the beginning, it was just about impossible to get one of those made. And getting it shipped off frequently involved Fred driving to Milwaukee with the shipping crate and the, uh, strapped to a car and pushing it over the fence. Uh, to some FedEx guy who had agreed to meet him on the other side of the fence because the office was closed and taking it over to an airplane because if it was one day later, we'd get penalized on the contract that we had and we just had not been able to get it finished any sooner than that. A year later, we were building several a month and it seemed easy, but at the beginning, it was just seemed impossible. And on one of those months, there was uh, a night when it's a couple days before the deadline and we're basically working all night to try to get the next one to work reliably. And all the uh, things that Fred could do uh, were done. He, the face panel was built and painted and beautiful and the shipping container was made and all the arrangements were made. And Fred had many roles at the time, but all that was left now for this thing was to debug the hardware and software so that it would actually work. And the thing about Fred though was even though he couldn't contribute, he, he wasn't going to leave. He was never going to leave when it wasn't finished. So he swept the floor and he hung out and he asked us how it was going and he got sleepy and he eventually fell asleep in a giant box of packing peanuts that we had in the middle of the floor and I still have a picture of him uh, just peacefully sleeping in the packing peanuts waiting for morning or until it was time for something else to happen because he was not going home if it wasn't finished. Thank you very much.